Are there any general questions or problems? Um, I did finish grading those first projects. Um, in most cases, there should not be a problem in carrying that through um, for the rest of the semester. For some people where I did make notes, um, either because I thought it was a problem or I wasn't really sure, please look sooner rather than later because if you're gonna have to change, you don't wanna be doing it the day before the second projects do where you can start researching all over again, so. Um, and I'm down to the last hundred <laughs> sprint reflections which go quicker, so I should have those done today or early tomorrow, just in time for Sprint Synthesis 3. Um, but anyway, so it goes. Questions on any of that? Um, okay, we were talking acids and bases. We're still talking acids and bases. And again, they're just equilibrium problems. And of course, all equilibrium problems, still true, they have three parts. So frankly, we don't do much of anything different here, right? There's only really two things that even suggest that it's worth talking about equilibrium acids and bases as somehow special. Right, and one is the thing we were talking about at the end of class on Friday, which is this thing called pH. Right, so again, for historical reasons, it is in fact far more common to refer to pH in an acid base problem than to refer specifically to the molarity, right, of the species involved. And so again, pH is very, very narrowly defined. It is only the concentration of the hydronium ion, which is really the donated protons, right? It is not the concentration of anything else that might be in the beaker, right? That's a little deceptive um, coming out of either high school or really Chem 1, where we talked about strong acids, right, which were acids that completely donate their protons. And this brings up the second reason that um, acid-base equilibrium deserves to be discussed as sort of a separate subtopic, which is the role of water, right? In the absence of a better base, right, water is the base for an aqueous acid. So if I just have HCl and water, nothing but HCl and water, water is technically there as the solvent, right? Because, but because water can be either an acid or a base, it will fill that role in the absence of anything better. And so since there's no other base, right? There is water. And so there will still be an acid base reaction within this case, the solvent, right? And so that makes acid base dissociation reactions kind of special all right i mean in some sense water is just another chemical but again primarily water is here as the solvent it is kind of unusual for the solvent to also be a reactant all right and because hcl is what's known as a strong acid it does 100 percent donate its protons to any base even a bad base like water and so this leads to possibly some confusion because if I have a 0.1 molar HCl solution, right, I get 0.1 molar hydronium ions, right? And so in some sense, it looks like I'm calculating the pH using, right, the concentration of the acid, but I'm really not. It just so happens that the acid 100% donated its protons, which gave me 
the exact same amount of H plus or more accurately hydronium, right? And so it's really this concentration that's the pH, not this concentration, even though in this case, it's the same number, right? But it's really referring to two different species, right? And in fact, my initial concentration of HCl doesn't really exist anymore because this reaction happens and it all reacts. And so the HCl concentration is technically zero in my beaker of HCl, aqueous HCl, right? Of course, there's no equilibrium required to solve that problem in the sense that the HCl completely dissociates, right? Where it would be more of an issue is if my HCl were what's known as a weak acid, right? And all that really means is there is an equilibrium. The HCl does not completely donate all its protons, right? And in that case, I pick randomly 75%. In that case, if I solve my ice chart, right, you'll note the concentration of protons, donated protons, is not the same as the initial concentration of the acid which is not the same, frankly, as the equilibrium concentration of the acid, right? So again, the pH is always referencing the equilibrium concentration of the donated protons, right? It is not ever technically the concentration of the acid. Even for a strong acid, it might be the same number, but it's not the same species. Right. But as you'll see in mere minutes, right, since these dissociation reactions always have the same basic ice chart, if I know the pH and therefore the concentration of the hydronium at equilibrium, the rest of the ice chart is known to me. Right. And so it's really just sort of a special way of recording my results for an acid base equilibrium. Right, and so, right, again, pH is not, not, not the concentration of the acid. It is the concentration of the donated protons. Right. Technically, from about this point forward, I really don't want to refer to H plus, right, because there really isn't any in a beaker of water, it's hydronium which is really the H plus stuck to a water molecule, right? It does get written and it's one of the things I hate, right? It does get written as though the acid is actually dissociating. Heck, that's the name for this type of reaction, right? But I think to some extent, again, that's deceptive in a couple ways. It implies that somehow the acid is unstable and is falling apart, right? And it also, again, sort of ignores my other big rule that I will spend the next couple of weeks trying to knock into your head and therefore remove the old high school, I won't even say it, the old high school lie about acids and bases. Because again, the only thing that an acid ever does is donate a proton to a base. And that's also true in my acid dissociation reactions, right? It just so happens, right, that the base is water, right? And so this is what I mean by an acid dissociation reaction. It does get written, I almost hate to do it, right? It does get written as what looks like an actual dissociation, right? Ignoring the presence of water, even though everything is in water. Right, that's where the name comes from. The book does it as a shortcut. The internet does it as a shortcut. It's all something of a gross oversimplification, or if you prefer, it's a lie, right? Acids don't fall apart because they're unstable, 
acids donate protons to bases because that's what acids do. And if you're in water, you have a base present. It also happens to be the solvent, right? And so my acid dissociation reaction isn't really the acid falling apart. It's the acid reacting with the water. In that context, this is exactly like every other equilibrium we've already looked at. And it's also like every acid-base reaction on the planet. There's an acid, which is the species that donates a proton to a base, which is the species that accepts the proton. Right. And in fact, the products are also an acid and a base, right? Because if you think of the reverse reaction, it's the proton going back where it started from. So in reverse, you still have a species that's donating a proton to another species, right? These are usually referred to as the conjugate acid and the conjugate base. I hate the C word, right? I kind of have to use it because your book and the internet use it, right? But an acid's an acid, a base is a base, right? Conjugate implies some form of subordination. It's on the product side, but especially not knowing what the specific acid re we're talking about is, I don't know whether the Ford reaction is more dominant than the reverse reaction. For a very, very weak acid, the K might be quite small, in which case the reverse reaction might be the favored reaction. And so I really have an acid in the base forming an acid in the base. They typically refer to the product acid and base as the conjugate acids and base, but an acid is an acid is a base to base. It does exactly the same thing in reverse, right? And the good news is, Every single Ka reaction looks like that, right? Pop in a different acid, you'll get a slightly different product, right? But it is always a single proton going from the acid to water, and you get what you get, right? All of these reactions are one to one to one stoichiometry-wise, and therefore all of these reactions fundamentally have the same basic equilibrium constant expression. So for the next week or two, stoichiometry sort of disappears, right? Everything's one to one to one. Right. And this is why, of course, the internet has prepackaged solutions to some of these problems, because the setup is quite similar no matter what the acid or base is. Right. Since the water is a pure liquid, you'll notice the water doesn't appear in the equilibrium expression, which is why the internet and your book can get away with the shorthand. I hate this, so I won't write it that way. Because again, I think it's deceptive in terms of what's actually happening in the way you're recording it. All right, and so my acid dissociation reactions are deceptively simple. They have very few words. In fact, they don't even need to have as many words as there are there, right? The second line doesn't need to be there. Right? For another reason related to why we talk about these as sort of a separate special case of equilibria, right? If I throw an acid in water, it reacts with the water. If I throw a base in water, it reacts with the water. Right. Pro single proton from the acid to the water or a single proton from the base to the water, right? And so if I have aqueous acids or aqueous bases, this reaction happens. There's no way around it, right? And so it is such a common reaction type that tables of equilibrium constants have been measured for all of my acids and all of my base because it's the same reaction all the time. If I throw HCl in water, it does the same thing every time. If I throw acetic acid in water, it does the same thing every time. 
And so other than the temperature dependence of the equilibrium constant, these things have been measured, at least at standard temperature. If you look in the appendix to the book or your favorite data table on the internet, it will reference 298 Kelvin as the temperature for these, right? Which is the number I crossed out, right? That number does not have to be given to you as part of the problem because it exists already in tables, right? And so the simplest enunciation of my acid or base problem is really just one question, which is frequently, if not almost always, what is the pH? Because again, that other special feature of my acids and bases is that we tend to talk about pH rather than the concentration of any particular product, right? And so the question is phrased deceptively simply, what is the pH of a 0.1 molar acetic acid solution, right? So again, if I can rail against the gods of high school education, right? Every teacher who was trying to be helpful that gave you tricks as to how to solve problems was the enemy. <laughs> In the sense that they tell you, hey, circle the numbers and then do something with them. It's not clear what to do with that one number. There's nothing, there's no other number for me to add it to, subtract it to, or divide by, right? Which is why rather than learning tricks and procedures, never hurts just to think your way through the problem, right? All problems have a tell to them as to what type they are. But again, if I'm always trying to plug into some prepackaged solution or follow some prescribed shortcut, right? I run a foul of trying to do this. I actually got a question, don't mean to call anybody out, but you know, yesterday is I don't know which equation to use on this homework problem. I got that like three times over the weekend. Right. Don't think in terms of equations. Just think. Right. If I'm looking for something and I have an equation involving that, maybe that's it. Right. And so the only real tell here is pH. Right. That fundamentally tells me two things. One, it's an acid base reaction because that's really the only time I ever talk about pH. It also tells me it's an equilibrium problem, even though it does not use the E word, and it also doesn't give me the equilibrium constant, right? Implicitly, pH is always the equilibrium concentration of the hydronium, right? And so those two little letters all by themselves imply both equilibrium, and acid base reaction. Right. If I know that, I'm going to want the equilibrium constant, in which case I go to the table in the back of the book or your favorite table on the internet, or quite possibly Wikipedia. Its scientific constants are usually pretty accurate. Right. And that's where I find this number 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. At that point, right, as soon as I knew it was an equilibrium problem, all equilibrium problems have three parts, right? The fact that it's an acid base reaction in water, which again is really only implied by this, it doesn't mention the water, it does mention molarity. And if there's no other solvent indicated, the default is always water, right? And so if I've got an acid or a base in water, the balanced equation is always the reaction with water. In the absence of any other acid or base, and at some point this week, we will throw other acids and bases in there, right? In the absence of any other species, water is the default. And so my acetic acid reacts with water. Again, the only thing that ever happens 
if you're thinking about what the product should be, stop. <laughs> All you ever do is move the proton from the acid to the base and you get what you get, which you'll note does not involve a salt and does not involve water. Right. Any acid reacting with water will always yield hydronium, which is why pH is a thing, right? And the other product is just the protonless acid, right? I took the H plus off of the acetic acid and put it on the water, and I was just left with acetic acid, right? Without the proton as the other product, right? And so it will always look like that which is why the subscript, right? The K subscript A implies reaction with water. That is not some magical constant that refers to acetic acid. It is the equilibrium constant for the reaction with water, right? And so every Ka looks pretty similar. The two species that are always present are the water because it is always reaction with water. If you react acetic acid with any other base on the planet, it is not a Ka reaction, right? And because water is always the base, hydronium is always one of the products, right? And the reaction is always one to one to one to one. Right. And so I can immediately construct the equilibrium expression as well as the ice chart. And again, if I'm talking about pH, it is the intersection of equilibrium and hydronium. Right. And as I'm fond of saying, really without thinking, I can always fill in the change line because after all, that is just stoichiometry. And again, for Ka reactions and Kb reactions, which are coming up shortly, right? it is always one to one to one to one. So minus X for the reactants and plus X for the products. All right, and the only thing I know, and frankly, the only thing I really need to know here is the initial concentration of the acetic acid. The water, isn't actually in the equilibrium constant, so its concentration doesn't matter. But there's lots of it at the beginning and lots of it at the end because it's actually just the solvent. And there's implicitly none of the products present initially, right? And so as soon as I fill in the initial line, I plus C is always E. And so at least symbolically, I know what the equilibrium concentrations of everything are. And as is frequently the case in my equilibrium problems of the second type, the whole challenge is to find X because there's one X for everything. And if I find X, I solve the entire ice chart and I know everything. In this case, the pH, Right, and again, right, I don't know any of the equilibrium concentrations, which is usually the case in equilibrium problems of the second type, but I do know the equilibrium constant because I looked it up in the table in the back of the book. And so I have an equation with one unknown, which is solvable. And of course, the first thing I'm gonna do if I wanna solve that is, What's that? I just didn't make up the word. I'm going to, I'm gonna make an assumption, right? It's not that complicated an equation. It's quadratic if I wanna solve it that way, right? Or of course, Wolfram Alpha or graphing calculator or, you know, phone a friend. But as I'm fond of saying, if I, make the assumption, I'll find out in 10 seconds or less whether it's a good assumption and it might save me some work. If I don't make the assumption, cross multiply, collect terms on one side, stick them in the quadratic equation, do a couple pages of algebra and I get a positive and a negative root. 
right? Which would solve my ice chart. On the other hand, right, I get 2.88. If I make the assumption, I'm done in two lines. I'm going to assume X is less than 0 0.100. Cross multiply, take the square root. I get 1.34 times 10 to the minus three. Right, again, my standard is my good old 5% rule, which is 1 20th of the 0.1 I was comparing it to. So anything less than 0 0.005 is considered significantly smaller and 0 0.001 is less than 0 0.005. So in fact, it is a good assumption, All right? And you'll notice, right, with much less algebra, I got essentially the same answer. Without the assumption, I got 1.33 times 10 to the minus three for X and a pH of 2.88. With the assumption, I got 1.34 times 10 to the minus three, All right? And 2.87. Again, my 5% rule exists to try to get me two sig figs, and there it is, right? 1.33 and 1.34 are the same to two sig figs. Right. Yes, no, maybe. And again, all acid dissociation reactions look the same. It is always a reaction with water and only water as the base. It is always only a single proton going from the acid to the water. And so every Ka reaction, every acid dissociation reaction end up looking pretty similar. Right. And frankly, that reaction happens whether you want it to or not, right? Even if I'm trying to mix acetic acid with something else like sodium hydroxide or ammonia or a much better base, there's still water there, that reaction's gonna happen. As you will eventually see later in the week, if I've got a better acid and a better base present, the water still will react but it's usually reacting at a much lower K value and resulting in a much smaller change in concentration of things than my acid and base of choice, right? That is not a very potent reaction because again, water, while it's both an acid and the base is not really good at either, right? And so no matter what acid-base reaction I'm trying to do, at the very least that is happening in the background. And so it will always need to be satisfied, right? I think for a number of reasons, acids are easier to recognize, right? Because, you know, first and foremost, an acid by definition is a proton donor. So the acid should have, it should have a hydrogen, right? On the other hand, having a hydrogen isn't enough. Right, I got like 20 bucks in my pocket. I'm not giving it to you, right? And so I'm not much of a donor if I'm unwilling to part with my $20, right? If I have a hydrogen that I don't wanna give up, right? I'm still not an acid, right? And so, you know, structurally, You can recognize acids partly by the proton, but it's really what the proton's bonded to that's also part of the equation. It has to be willing to give up the proton, right? And what might make it willing to give up the proton is what is left after it gives up the proton, right? If I may anthropomorphize my molecules for a moment, right? My acid has to be happy after it's given up the proton, right? If it doesn't make it happy to give up the proton, 
don't do it. Consider that a life lesson from your Uncle Joe, right? And so, you know, something like CH4 has four hydrogens. They don't come off, right? Methane is not an acid, right? In part because, in large part, because what you're left with isn't happy. Right, and so if I'm gonna donate a proton, I have to be left with something happy. So if you look at the table of acids and bases, what you'll notice is they really fall into two main categories, right? These are hydrogen halides, right? If, I promised I didn't wanna write them this way, but I will for the moment, right? If the proton comes off, what I'm left with is a negative ion. Right, I have to be happy as a negative ion for the acid to want to donate the proton in the first place. If you look at the ion I'm left with, right, those are all highly electronegative ions. Right. And so they're happy, if I may say so, without the proton, right? And so hydrogen bonded to something highly electronegative will be acidic. Hydrogen bonded to carbon, which is not highly electronegative. Carbon is about the same electronegativity, it's slightly higher than hydrogen. Right, therefore, it doesn't want to donate the proton because it's not happy being a negative ion when you're done. The other thing, if you look through the list of acid and bases, you'll notice is they're all polyatomics. Right, my list of polyatomic ions is a thing because they are very stable and very happy, usually because of resonance as negative ions. And so if I have hydrogen bonded to a polyatomic, it will also tend to come off, right? Because the thing I'm left with is again, a happy in this case, happy polyatomic ion as opposed to a happy single atom ion. What makes hydrofluoric acid a bad acid? It's not a bad acid, it's just not a strong acid. It, well, I mean, part of it is size as well. I mean, remember HF hydrogen bonds, whereas the other ones don't because of the similar size of the H and the F. But Um, I mean, it's a good acid. It's just not generally considered a strong acid. All right. And so because, you know, I'm in some sense hunting for an H and then looking at what it's bonded to, it's fairly easy to note acids. Bases are a little trickier, all right, especially the way they're usually written, right? NH3 is a base. There's nothing about the way I write that would, that would lead you to believe NH3 is a base. Right. In fact, you could be misled to think that NH3 is an acid because, hey, look, there's a hydrogen. Right. The tell for a base is generally hidden right, in the molecular structure, it would be clearer if I wrote the Lewis structure, because if you look at the list of bases, right, and we talked about water being a base, right, here's the thing, right, if you're gonna be a proton acceptor, right, first of all, a proton's positively charged, so right off the bat, the thing that's most gonna want a proton is, A what? 
well, beyond that electron group, I mean, if you're a positive proton, you're going to be most attracted to automatically any negative ion, right? But of course, you know, molecules tend not to be negative ions, but, you know, NO3 minus is a base. Why? It's negatively charged, right? Cl minus is a base. Why? It's negatively charged. Inherently, positives are always attracted to negatives. The next best thing to be negatively charged is essentially what you were alluding to a minute ago, which is the electron issue, right? Structurally, H plus is nothing but a naked proton, right? I mean, hydrogen is a proton and an electron. So an H plus, here's my 100% accurate drawing of H plus. <laughs> just a proton which means it is incapable of forming bonds after all bonds are electrons being shared and so if h plus is going to form a bond whatever it's bonding to has to bring the electrons all right and so the things that tend to be bases are nitrogen or phosphorus containing compounds or oxygen containing compounds right not because of the phosphorus itself per se or the oxygen or the nitrogen but if you look at the compounds that those things form right they all tend to have one or more non-bonding pairs of electrons right And if you're going to be an H plus and form a bond, you have to find something that has electrons to donate because you don't have any electrons yourself, right? And so if you look at the list of acids and bases, they tend to all be nitrogen or phosphorus containing compounds, as well as a few sulfur and oxygen containing compounds, mostly because of the Lewis structure. And so they're a little less obvious um, when you see them just written out with a molecular formula. And so a lot of times I say, go hunting for the acid first, because if there is an acid, the only thing an acid can ever do is donate a proton. So once you see an acid, go looking for the base, because if the acid is doing anything other than hanging around as orange juice for breakfast, right, there's gotta be a base present because that's the only thing my acids ever do is donate a proton to a base. All right, so again, it's easier to spot the acids. The bases, you can learn to spot them. All right, and bases do a similar thing in water. All right, now, again, since water is amphoteric or amphiprotic, same thing, All right? Since water goes both ways, it can be either an acid or a base. If you pair it with an acid, it acts as a base. If you pair it with a base, it acts as an acid. And so bases also react with the solvent in what's known as base dissociation reactions. Again, it's fundamentally a similar reaction to my Ka reaction, except the protons go in the other way, right? In the case of the acid, the water got the proton. In the case of the base, the water gives up the proton, right? which gives rise to 
what might be considered your old friend hydroxide, right? This is the reason for the semi-mythological belief, right, that all bases have hydroxide. That is also a gross oversimplification or a lie you were told, right? Bases don't have hydroxide. I just mentioned ammonia. NH3, no hydroxide. On the other hand, all bases generate hydroxide if they're in water, not because they themselves necessarily have a hydroxide, but because water acts as the acid and donates a proton, which generates a hydroxide, no matter what the structure of the base is, right? The hydroxide that bases manifest comes from the water, not the base itself. Right. These reactions, like the Ka reactions, are always one to one to one to one. Right. And so stoichiometry, again, not really an issue. Everything has a stoichiometry of one. The water, again, as a pure liquid, doesn't appear in the equilibrium expression. So again, my KBs all look similar. Right. By their very nature, you can never get more than a quadratic with either the Ka's or the Kb's. So they are mercifully solvable right, with or without my assumption. But again, my assumption works more often than not. And the form of the question looks very, very similar also, right? It is usually a question of pH. Right. And so I could ask, and I just did, what is the pH of a 0.25 molar ammonia solution? Now, again, right, as aspiring chemists, the, um, that might overstate it. There's a gross overstatement, right? But as aspiring chemistry students, right, it might not be immediately obvious that NH3 is a base. And so I always say, you know, you're looking for the tells, right? The fact that there's a pH asked about suggests it's either an acid or a base, right? Because that's the only kind of reaction I would ever ask about the pH, right? And so again, I'm thinking acid and base. There's two ways I might know ammonia is a base. Anybody want to take a shot at what one of them is? It's what? I just told you. <laughs> Assuming I hadn't just told you, yes, you could phone a friend. The, um, assuming I hadn't just told you. Yeah, I mean, there's a KB. The other reason is the one I mentioned a minute ago. You can pretend, you know, now I did tell you, right? It does have a nitrogen, right? Again, that by itself is not definitive. After all, nitric acid also has a nitrogen. Right. But if I go to my table of acids and bases, which is where these equilibrium constants come from, right, the fact that it has a KB and not a KA means it's a base. Right. That's where the subscript is helpful. Right. It's on my list of bases, not on my list of acids. Right. And again, implicitly, there's water present because it's a solution, it's not pure ammonia. Right. And so implicitly, the other reactant is water. Right. And so, you know, it's an equilibrium problem. And of course, all equilibrium problems have three parts. And so balanced equation, ice chart and K equation. Again, in the absence of anything better. Right. And it I still have water, and so water is always my default acid for the base, right? And again, I shouldn't have to think too hard about what the products are, because the only thing I ever do is move the proton from the acid, which in this case is water, to the base, which in this case is ammonia. And I get whatever I get. I don't really need to think about it. Right, I take this H, I put it over there. I got one more H, 
four instead of three, and I got a positive charge because the H came over without its electron. And that leaves behind right, OH minus because that's water without an H. Instead of H2O, it's HO. And it lost a positive charge. So it's now minus. All right. And so then it's ice chart K equation and solve. All right. And so I have my initial concentration of the ammonia. Again, the water is plentiful and doesn't really need to be tracked because it's not in the equilibrium expression. There are, is by default, since it was not mentioned, no products present. The change line, I fill in almost without thinking. All right, minus X on the left-hand side, plus X on the right-hand side. And of course, I plus C equals E. So as soon as I filled in the I line, the E line all but fills itself in. All right. And the game, as always, with one of my type two equilibrium problems is find a way to find X, all right? In this case, since I have the equilibrium constant, the equilibrium expression is my bestest way, all right? And so if I plug in the equilibrium amounts of everything into my KB expression, I get one equation with one unknown, it should be solvable. And of course, if I'm gonna solve it, I'm gonna I'm gonna try the assumption. Again, you could solve it as a quadratic. You could do it on rule from alpha. Right. I tend to try the assumption because hey, it works more than it doesn't. And so if I assume x is much less than 0.25. All right, cross multiply, take the square root, what could be simpler, All right? Again, my test is my 5% rule, that's my two sig fig rule. So 0 0.25 divided by 20 is 5%. That's 0 0.0125, so my standard of small is 0 0.0125, right? 0 0.002, right, is a factor of six smaller than small. So it's a good assumption. Right. And so my ice chart has all but solved itself. Right. Again, technically at this point, I really only have two sig figs, which you can see here. Right, I assumed X was small, which means it's, this should not be changing. And it doesn't to two sig figs. So technically I wrote these as three, but this is really probably only two sig figs at this point. Right. Now again, here's where the very narrow definition of pH right, means I'm, my work is not quite done, right? It asks for the pH. pH is by definition the concentration of hydronium. I don't have any, at least from this reaction, right? I have hydroxide, I have ammonium, I have ammonia. None of those can be used to calculate the pH because pH has to be by definition, right? Negative log of the hydronium. So if I'm gonna calculate a pH, I have to find the hydronium. And the good news is there is hydronium. It's just not from this reaction, right? Because there's again, this funny thing about water, right? Water is both an acid and a base, right? And so, if water is an acid and water is a base, why doesn't it react with itself? Answer, it does. Because again, if you're a molecule, you're just running around randomly bumping into things. If water bumps into water, there's no reason why it can't donate a proton since water is an acid and water is a base, right? 
This reaction, for semi-obvious reasons, is called the auto-ionization of water, right? I've got two water molecules that form two ions. It auto-ionized, right? Again, it's simply a transfer of an H plus from the acid to the base, just so happens in this case, the acid and the base both are water. Right. This reaction happens all the time if you have water, just regular old neat water, pure, unadulterated water is actually an acid-base reaction in a beaker. Right. And again, this reaction happens whether you want it to or not because molecules don't follow instructions, they do what they're going to do, which means, right, if I have water, I always have both of these. Which is why the question of pH for a base makes sense, right? Technically, my ammonia made hydroxide. It didn't make hydronium, but you're in water. And this reaction is always happening in the background. So if you have hydroxide, you have hydronium and vice versa. And so maybe we'll pick it up there on Wednesday, right? But as a result, I can use the hydroxide that I actually got from my base in my KW reaction, my autoionization reaction, to come up with a pH, even though it didn't make hydronium itself. And so KW to be continued on Wednesday. Otherwise, happy March 1st. Oh, I should mention, I probably defer in or moving office hours tomorrow because I have a, a COVID vaccine scheduled in the morning, so. I will email you with the hour change later. If you have questions, I am still here. <laughs>